I know you're going to dig this. Hi, this is Stan, the man, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, zooming in all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Jelly Bean Johnson. He's an actor, guitarist. He's also one of the baddest producers from time. And also, let's give him a big big hand man because i'm gonna just clap right now man you have got me excited just knowing i got you on screen jelly bean <laughs> how are you doing sir uh, i'm good it's a nice thursday morning here yeah. <laughs> well you know what this is an exciting day for me because i have been wanting to get you on our show for quite a while and this mm -hmm. is one of my exciting days i'm gonna tell you that right now and and just here here's what we want to do I just want you to take off by just telling us from the beginning how you got started uh, as far as music is concerned. I mean, start from your young life and move on up. How did the music industry get into your brain? Well, uh, with me, uh, my mom moved me here when I was uh, 12, 13 years old from Chicago. Uh, she moved me here because the gangs in Chicago were recruiting me and uh, she wasn't having it. So. I moved here, uh, 1968, 13 years old, you know, and that's kind of when I started, you know, shortly after that, beginning my musical journey, I started, you know, being around uh, kids that had, you know, similar backgrounds, you know, like Morse Day, and, uh, Terry Lewis, uh, Prince, you know, so I, I started, you know, being around them and found out that we had similar taste in music and, and we just went from there. I mean, we just, uh, through the years, we had rival bands. You know, uh, I was in a band with Terry Lewis called Flight Time. Uh, Flight Time was uh, uh, a 11 piece band way before it became a famous production company or whatever. And uh, Prince had a band called, uh, with his cousin and Andre Simone called Grand Central. And mind you now, by now, now we were like 14, 15 years old. And, uh, and we're just playing, you know, we're just playing around. It was limited places we could play, you know, because we, it wasn't like we could play nightclubs and like that, but we could play like sororities and stuff like that or different college functions or whatever would hire us. And, uh, and we just moved on through it, man. We, you know, we, uh, you know, had all had this great love for music and, uh, and, uh, here we are, you know, and eventually, you know, Prince was the first one of us to make it, you know, he around 18 years old, he, uh, you know, he, uh, did his first solo record for Warner Brothers. And so we were all, you know, excited for him and, and watching him and seeing how that was going to go. Cause you know, that was our ultimate goal too, was to, to be like that. So once he made it, it was like, wow, you know, you know, and then uh, just by chance he came back and started recruiting us, you know. Well, let's uh, let's, let's know, take, let's take you back. Let's, let's go back here just a little bit uh, about Jelly Bean uh, one. What all instruments do you play, and how did you learn that instrument? Okay, uh, I, I, my main instruments are the drums and the guitar. Um, I started learning the drums around 12, 13 years old. My mom put me in lessons for like six months. And after a while, I made her stop doing them because, you know, you know when you're a kid, when you're a 12, 13 year old kid, and uh, you go to school five days a week and you're getting up at 7 a.m. or whatever, you know, and then you can only take these, I can only take lessons on the weekend. And, you know, it gets to be Saturday morning. Well, hell, I want to sleep in a little bit, you know. So 
and my lesson would be at eight o'clock a m on saturday so that I means that's only one day sunday i was gonna get to sleep in so and then at the, uh, the other insult to it is that the guy was only teaching me like rock and roll jerry Lee lewis kind of stuff and let's be frank here i'm you know i'm black i want to learn james brown and you know and tower of power and stuff like that so after that i told my mom you know i, I made her stop doing it and uh start teaching myself and so the old-fashioned way back in the day i was just telling that on one of my friends podcast the other day is that i would lay my butt down in front of my mom's studio and put the records on and i would listen and try to figure out what the drummer was doing on these records that's one of my questions my questions i was going to ask you what music influenced you when you said you sit down and you start playing records who were they well, you know, coming from Chicago, you know, I had all the Chicago thing, but the the main one at that point was was James Brown. There was probably the Funkadelic. Uh, there was a uh, uh, Tower of Power. You know, people like that. Far as drumming, you know, uh, and then as I got more advanced, and you know, I got more into the fusion records, the more Chick Corea's and the Turner Fairer, all that kind of stuff, uh, weather reports, people like that. Wow. You know, the thing that. Uh that I've always liked to ask people, as far as your family is concerned, did anybody else play instruments? Was anybody in your family uh, musically inclined? No, no, but I, I just, I had a cool ass mom, you know, and she always, always, you know, encouraged me, you know, whatever instrument, if I needed drums, she would buy them. Uh, in later years, when I needed a guitar, I needed some guitar, she would buy that. And uh, I was just fortunate, you know, that she recognized that I had a talent in that, uh, you know, that she nurtured it and, and, and helped me along the way there with that. And so when you started learning these instruments as a young a, a young guy, uh, you mentioned James Brown's music, but who were some of the in, musicians that influenced you? Well, and uh, of course, James Brown was a, a class double fill, uh, top artist David Garibaldi. Um, there's, wow, I'm, I'm leaving some of the great drummers out. Um, uh, I can't think of another one that, you know, oh, Billy Cobham, you know, people like that, you know, just yeah. a lot of R&B, all the R&B drummers, all the, you know, I was totally into the R&B because I came from Chicago. So I was totally into R&B records and stuff, and I didn't necessarily know who the drummers was. I just knew I liked their beats and stuff like that. So. Well, I'm, I'm a drummer myself, and, and the thing is, is usually when, when, when mom let you, let you uh, play some drums, your thing is, is that, what, what were some of the type drums did you get when you first begin you know did you just did you just get you know that that snare and tom and and one little bass and a cymbal tell me about it I, I just oh my god yeah well well up to 12 years old she would always buy these paper damn drum sets that's what i'm talking about yeah. and i would get them on christmas day and by christmas night they'd be tore up okay so <laughs> then one uh, when i turned 13 she impressed me she actually brought me a drum set that i couldn't break I couldn't tear it up. It was actually a decent, you know, for being a 13 year old kid, it was actually a decent drum set. And it was like just a snare and a bass drum and a tom, maybe a full tom. It didn't have a hi-hat yet. I got that later, I had to learn that. <laughs> That's what but, I'm <laughs> but I couldn't tear it up, you know? Yeah, so I started yeah. getting good at that. And then when she saw that, oh, well, he's okay. He's decent at that, I'm gonna get him a hi-hat. He's, you know, <laughs> you know, cause I was like, mom, I need a hi-hat. So, and so she got that. And so that's that's how I started, man. And then I just progressed, and and as I got better and better, she got better drum sets. You know. Okay. So now we, we we're now. You know, if you notice, I'm trying to take you from the beginning to where you are today. So my thing uh -huh. is 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 because you know those who don't know Jelly Bean, but I'm pretty sure most everybody do. But my thing is <laughs> is that as you started learning your instrument, you're now in, in you're 16, 17 years old. Where are you at now as far as bands, or have you gotten into a group at that time? Tell well, me. yeah, by, by the time I was 15, I was in flight time. And uh, and we were pretty good to be 15 years old, man. I tell people that to this day. We we were advanced 15 years old. You know, we had Cynthia, remember Cynthia Johnson from Funky Tom fame? She was our lead singer. And we had uh, David Island, who's a world-class um, uh, instrumentalist, period, but saxophone player back then. And... Uh, we had like four or five horn players. We had a keyboards, guitars, and Terry Lewis was the bass player. And uh, we got good, man. And we would rehearse at uh, 
David Isla's dad was uh, was the vice president of Pillsbury. So we would practice in his basement every night after school. After we get out of, out of school, that's where we'd be there until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, rehearsing. And we got to be pretty good. You know, and like I said, we, that's when we ended up being rival bands with Prince. Prince was in Grand Central with uh, his cousin Chaz and Andre Simone, who were originally, uh, who after a while he ended up, Morris Day ended up being in there. But me and Morris had, had a relationship because I used to, uh, hang out with him when I was like 12, 13, we used to play drums in his mom's living room together. And so I knew him anyway from, you know, from before, so. All right, so as as the flight time gets bigger and, and, and well-known locally, okay, were, was any recordings done at that time at all? It was a few, they out here in the universe here right now, but, uh, Nothing significant, you know, no major label, label deals, but locally, yeah, uh, there was there's a few things. Uh, there's still there's a few things out in the universe right now. Oh man, I, I, I like to hear that beginning of Flight Times music. That would yeah, been oh yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. some out there when we're like 17, 18 years old, man. I forgot it's it's a record here you can get locally. You can ask, probably ask the, the electric fetus here. There's a historical store here called the Electric Fetus, and it has all that stuff. All right, now we're, 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 we're flight time is getting well known locally. Where do you go from there? Okay, we're getting locally and everything. Like we said, we're watching Prince. I remember going to his uh, first concert, in 1978. Here was at a, a movie theater that we all used to go watch all the black exploitation films. Mm -hmm. Well, he came back as the local hero, and and, and we, it was called a Capri Theater. It's still here. They renovated and all that stuff for the. And just watching him, man, and just being fascinated about, you know, wow, you know, that's what, where we wanted to be, you know. So just, you know, watching him and, and just hoping and stuff, you know, that, you know, we could catch a break if somebody sees us, you know. And at this time, you know, you got to remember by this time, Minneapolis wasn't a hotbed yet either, you know. It was just a little sleepy, cold town, you know. So uh, so we just kept going at it and kept going at it until finally he reached back, you uh, and you know started recruiting several members out of the band and stuff and you know that kind of began this whole musical journey here okay and, and as as you as you're moving up and you you named a few musicians uh were they were there groups that influenced you that you wanted to go ahead on and, and cover their songs while you are entertaining what are some of those oh. some of those groups that that just well blew definitely part of the funkadelic and we was really into the people uh like I said, James Brown, Tower of Power, because we had horns. Uh, wow, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, I'm leaving somebody else out that we used to be called. Uh, oh, Cooling the Game. Oh, yeah. Cooling the Game, yeah. a lot of Cooling yeah. Game. Yeah, and just, you know, anything anything that was funky and anything that had a girl singer. Oh, Rufus, Chaka Khan, Rufus, because we had Cynthia. So we would do a lot of that kind of stuff. So we, we, we pretty much had the cover band thing down, man. We were really good at it. And we were advanced at, like I said, 16, 15, 16, 17 years old. We could really play that stuff. So. Man, that, that, that sounds exciting. That sounds exciting. So now as the band gets a little uh, well-known, okay, where, where did the uh, time group start at and how? The time group started because, of, like I said, Prince came back. For, for one, it started because Morris went, him and Morris were tight because Morris ended up being the drummer in Grand Central there after his cousin, after uh, his cousin fell out, Prince's cousin fell out. So anyway, when Prince got big, he took Morris out on the road as a person just filming him in concert. So, uh, you know, and they used to hang out and stuff. And Morris, to, uh, one night at, at Prince's house, they was cutting stuff. They was hanging out and they was cutting and Morris did a song you know, he came up with a groove call, uh, which eventually ended up being Party Up. And Prince liked it. So uh, Prince made him a deal. He said, I can give you like 20K for this song, or I can help you put together a band. And Morris said, cool, we'll help you put together the band. So that's how that started. But the only problem was Morris, like I said, when me and Morris were 11, 12 years old, we were drummers. So Morris just wanted to play drums. He didn't want to be out front. So, uh, you know, so that was a problem. But anyway, so anyway, they had this fateful meeting. I guess you, everybody that's know about this history know about the fateful meeting they had. Because by this time, flight time, you know, we were getting bigger. We were like 16, 17, 18 years old. We recruited Alexander O'Neill as our lead singer. 
So uh, Chris came back, you know, and he got with Morris and they had a meeting and stuff. And he he got, uh, he had Alex, he had uh, Jimmy and Terry, Monty, and uh, Alex go to this meeting with them out here in Middle Talk and stuff. Well, I wasn't invited because Morris was going to play the drums. So Morris felt bad about that, but that's what it was right there. And also during this time, Morris had a cousin who had a hit record. Uh, I don't know if you remember the band Champagne. Yeah. How, uh, had, they had a hit record called How About Us, whatever. But anyway, those were his cousins. So he was like, "Be well, you know, you know, I can probably get you the drum spot in that or whatever. But anyway, that was, you know, I, I didn't worry about that. You know, I was just happy that they, you know, Prince was giving them a chance. So anyway, everybody knows they went to the meeting. Alex acted up. <laughs> I love me them. But uh, he, he needed paper and he needed a house and all that. Well, anybody knows Prince, that ain't going to fly, you know. So Prince, the, basically the meeting was over. Uh, Prince told Morris, saying, you know what? I'm going to teach you how to be out front. You go back and you get Jelly Bean to play the drums. And and I'm going to teach you how to be out front. And Morris was reluctant at first, you know, because he didn't know what to do. But he said, I'll teach you. And wow. That's how the time basically came came together. Uh, also, then uh, by this time, Jesse Johnson had moved here and uh, jo joined a band that Morris was drumming in called the Enterprise Band of Pleasure. So, uh, you know, and anybody knows Jesse was ridiculous on the guitar. We hadn't seen anybody really play the guitar like that. He, he, so, he's awesome. You know, Jesse is Prince awesome. Him. Prince seen it. See, you, Prince told him, you know, even while, without really hearing him play, he said, I like the way you look. You're in. So. <laughs> <laughs> So that's when we ended up with Jesse. So Jesse joined us and we did that thing. And you know, we did a few local things before it really started taking off. And then Chris started putting us through boot camp and stuff, eight hours a day and stuff. And, 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 and that's, that's something. I, I remember some of your first songs as time, man. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. How, uh, you know, who, who wrote some of them, who produced those, and uh, just well, give, me well, some, give me some stories. Chris, on Chris, Chris and Morris, they did the whole first record together. Cause like by this time they were, you know, like Morris was hanging out with him and living with him and all that stuff. So they were cut and stuff at Prince's house. And so they did the whole first record. So get it up. We put get it up out and uh, it just kind of blew up, you know? And mind you now, we're, we used to study no kids from the North side, you know, we have a bar band basically. So now it's this big thing. So Prince, he, he, he was, he was, he was smart calculate, man. He just waited. And he took us to uh, Detroit uh, at Joe Louis Arena in front of 25, 26,000 people and didn't tell them, you know, by this time, you know, uh, get it up. Uh, the electrifying DJ Mojo had blown this up to ridiculous portions in Detroit. So they, they, you know, they knew about us, but they had never seen us. So uh, Prince was doing a concert there and he brought us there. He didn't tell them. And so he throws us out there, man, and I never forget. I, I just my heart was in my mouth, man. It was. It, I've never heard people scream like that when they found out that it was us opening the show, and twenty six thousand people lost their mind. It, it was crazy. So that's that's that was our first concert. Was you know from playing in the bar in, uh, in front of twenty six thousand people. That, the that, time. That, 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 that had to blow. That had to blow your mind. I, I, it was crazy, man. Yeah. It was. I'll never forget that. Now, some of the songs on that first album. Can you tell me a little bit about them? And, and uh, you know. Well, anybody knows the, the the early time albums only had like few the, like the first album only had six songs. So you know we we only oh, Prince only gave us like thirty minutes of concert. So right. we had to squeeze all them six songs in there. And so, uh, but it was just cool to, to play them. And speaking of cool, I was just uh, saying on my radio show last night stuff, that's, that's the barometer to who we are 40, 30, 40 years later. When we do shows even now, that's my barometer of how the nice is gonna be is when we do cool. We do song cool about three, four songs in. And when we, when we hit the first parts of that song, I can tell by the people's reaction what kind of night we're gonna have. And usually it's asses wiggling, so that you know that that, that song alone, that's from the first record. It it, it really gets people going, and it, and it defines what kind of night we're gonna have. And the choreography, you know, I have seen time from, from way back all the way up. Really, I just seen them about a year or so ago live, uh -huh. and 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 I I just love that the choreography of Cool. It is just awesome. Who 
who who puts that choreography together? It was, it's, it's nothing well, back, fancy. Back in, the day, it's, back in the day, it was 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 Morris and Jerome, basically. Morris and Jerome came up with a lot of dance steps that we you know we still do here 30, 40 years later. That's right. They were great about that. And the guys, everybody, you know, was good about it. Prince always encouraged that too. Prince used to get on us about uh you know, like 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 Money and Jimmy had to be singing, dancing at the keyboard and playing at the same time. Well, you know, that's not no easy shit to do. No, it's not. But he insisted that you do that. You know, you had to sing a part, you had to play your parts, you know, physically play your parts, and your feet had to be moving. And mind you, these two guys are at the keyboards. Now I'm the only one that's, you know, in a in a stationary place. They they're, you know, they they gotta move around. They gotta move too. So so that's the thing. And uh and with them, he just wanted Morris to put his hand in his pocket and, and just be cool and be this cool character running around and use Jerome as a foil as his a ballet. And Terry and Jesse just had to do their thing, just back and forth, constant movement. I was saying that on my radio show last night. When you went and seen the original time and back in the day, you didn't know who to look at because it was constant movement from everybody. That's right. Well, that was eight hours a day, seven days a week of rehearsing. So that's why we were like that. Man, that, that it just sounds so exciting, and and uh, it, one thing I've always loved about that band, they they kicked it from the beginning to the end. I I never seen time without just performing from one. You know, you had I think about two, maybe three ballads in your show, yeah, yeah. but the rest yeah. of the time you you were you were funky and moving, man, and I just loved it. I really did. Yeah. It's a, it's a culture. This 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 is how we this how we came up, you know. So it's a, it's the culture. It's still that way to this day. You know, so. so now you know, uh, as as you've traveled and and now as be, have become a big star, you know what what advice would you give to some of these young musicians, man, today that are just wanting to be a jelly bean? Well, oh wow, well. <laughs> you know I get asked this all the time and stuff. My whole thing is, is business wise, get your, keep your business stuff together, be less trusting, you know, make sure that, you know, you have people that's in your corner and have your back, you know, cause that's the hurt thing. You can, you can have a great career and everything, but your business part of it can really sidetrack you, man. And, and you know, and I, I watch a cautionary tale as I've been coming up now and going through all this stuff I've been through with my you know, rich famous friends and all that stuff. You, you have to protect yourself and you have to make them respect what you do with them. Because if you don't, you're going to have problems, you know, and, and you can end up very being very disappointed. Stuff. You know, I, I remember uh, about six months ago, I was, I was online watching some with Daryl Hall and he was talking about, you know, the music business. Now, this is Daryl Hall, you know, from Hall Notes. And he's talked about all the uh, different crazy things he's been through in the music business that really, you know, hurt him. You know, uh, Steve Lukather from Toto, same thing, you know, and still fighting to this day for publishing and stuff like that. You have, if, especially if you're a songwriter, you know, you have to take all that in. The music business today is totally different than it was back then. And, and that's what I wanted to ask you. When it comes, when it comes to Jelly Bean, we've, we know about Jelly Bean, the, uh, the musician. What about Jelly Bean, the producer, and some of, the, some of those uh, great acts that you've helped produce? mint condition and others uh, tell me a little bit about that well I, i've been blessed i was blessed to be an organization you know i guess it was a bless and a curse in a lot of ways but i was blessed to to get the opportunity to you know to produce some of these these great you know iconic acts over the years and stuff man and that they trust me now mind you being in flight time you know with terry and jimmy you got to realize anybody that came to them for a song I wanted them producing and they gave them to me, that artist wanted Terry and Jimmy. Mm -hmm. So that always put a whole different dynamic on it. They didn't want Jelly Bean, they wanted Terry and Jimmy. So it was up to me to prove myself to them that I knew what the hell I was doing. And and I'm gonna tell you this and we are gonna try this and hopefully it works. If it don't, then it's on me, you know? And that's the thing when you when you're an artist and stuff, especially the established artists, you you want established people producing you. You don't want this hot shot guy. You know, you you're not sure if you want to give them a chance with your career, but that's a part of production. That's part of part of being producing, and you just have to go for it and see what happens. I I got lucky there. I had five top ten hits at 
my time, you know, and I got to trust other people that I did have those hits with. But uh, it, it was not easy, man, because, like I said, they wanted Terry and Jimmy. They didn't want Jelly Bean. They wanted Terry and Jimmy. So. And and my thing is, did you did you perform on any of those uh, hits that? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of them. I, I did guitar solos. I did some keyboard work. I did uh, program bass parts. You know, all the things a production person has to do. You know, I I con them into singing stuff, right? I wrote lyrics. I got with, you know, Lisa Keith. Lisa Keith was a great writing partner partner of mine. And uh and you know, I I had watched Terry and Jimmy enough to know what you had to do. I I I watched them, I was just telling this story I must uh, show up today too. Uh you know back in the day you used to make a singer sing in 90, 95 the zillion times and stuff over and over again line by line. And I had watched them do that. Well, then when I did my first thing with Nona Hendrix, you know, Nona Hendrix, a legend and a soul sister. And, you know, I never forget, I got the track down and she liked it and we got the lyrics together. And she said, hey, baby, we're going we gonna, to, you know, we're going to sing this a few times. And then I want you to just take what you like and make, you know, make the, the verse, make the songs and stuff. You know, we ain't gonna, we're not going to be here all night, you know, me just singing over and over line by line. And it worked out, you know. Great. And I can frankly say most of my productions are like are like that, you know. I I would have the artist sing them, you know, x amount of times and stuff, but it was never that line by line, painstakingly line by line, note by note, pitch by pitch thing, because that's hard to do now. Trust me, there's a lot of uh, uh, Hall of Fame records that's that way, that was done that way. But you know, I I'll, I'll, I got lucky with the productions I did. And I always was blessed to sing, you know, to do great singers on it, like Stokely Williams, Mint Edition. Yeah, yeah. I was just I talking about Ralph Tresvant from New Edition yesterday. You know, Ralph Tresvant is one of the greatest singers in the studio I've ever seen. I've heard Jimmy Jam say this on some of his things too, but Ralph is phenomenal in the studio as far as singing parts and singing them the way you want them in, in the soul and the pitch and all that. And mind you, he's in a group with Johnny Gill. So that makes it even more crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, man. Yeah, uh, the thing is, I, one question I wanted to ask you before we uh, uh, move on: uh, what, what do you think about the internet today? What it, is it? A, is it a plus or a minus for for the music today? Uh, well, as, that's a, like like I was saying, production is a plus and a curse, you know, because the internet kind of killed the business. Fires now, people can just, you know download your music for free and all that kind of stuff you know so it, it kind of changed the whole landscape of music uh the way we know it but then it, you still you're getting your stuff to uh, millions and millions and millions of people and it kind of took the record companies out of it too i'm sure the record companies ain't too happy about it you know in a lot of ways but okay. the young artists young superstar artists now you know the internet is everything for them you know they they have these gigantic fan bases and 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 they're loving it, you know, and see, and that's the only thing right now, you know, you don't make as much money now off records as you did back in the day. Mm -hmm. Now you have to get your ass out and work. You have to get out and play and perform, you know, and that's what makes this time that with this pandemic and all this stuff going on, all this unrest and stuff going on right now is hard on artists or musicians now because we can't get out and play because this is how you're making your money now. Yep. You have to get out in people's face and, and show what, what you can do. Well, tell us a little bit about Jelly Bean, what he's doing right now today. What? A, tell me a little bit about this new song that uh, just been released. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I like I like to know a little bit about she, she can get it. I, she can get it. How did that How she did that come about? Is, uh, she can get it is by my 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 great. He, he calls me. I call him my nephew. You know, I got a, a ten zillion nephew, musical nephews, and laws one of them. But anyway. Law always idolizes the time he used to play, has played in New York so many times, starting back from the original band all the way through now, you know. And most of the time when we would play there, Law would come and see us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he idolized us, he loved us, he would hang out with us and everything anyway. So anyway, the last year and stuff here, I've been doing my own little solo thing. I started off with Put Some Jelly on it and it, it let me shine on it. So now we're into uh, She Can Get It. and. Uh, he, he, he found out I was doing a project and he's like, uh, Uncle Bean, man, I would love to do something with you. He always wanted to do something with me and Monty and 
the guys at the time anyway, you know, because he knew we were producers in addition to being, you know, musicians. So, uh, so I, I guess that's a young fella, you know, when we get the chance, we'll do so. Well, now's the time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for, uh, solo thing the first time in my life. And, uh, you know, and I need help. I'm not gonna lie. I've, I've been asking all my musical friends and musical heroes that, you know, I can have access to to help me out and stuff. And, you know, and he came up with this song and I like it. It's like, kind of like a club. It was kind of like a Brooklyn meet Minneapolis kind of thing. And, uh, I like what he did. I like that he got, you know, Monty in it. My, uh, my brother in arms, Monty Morris on it. And, uh, and Tony M from MPG, you know, anybody knows about Prince and Get Off and all that kind of stuff. And Tony's, you know, Sexy M Elf, all that. That's Tony right there with the with the rap stuff. So we put him on it, man, and we just we wanted a a a, a another ass wiggling song for the clubs. Cause you know, you gotta put out songs, you know, that that the ladies gonna like, you know, that's gonna, you know, that the clubs gonna be banging in the clubs. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. You know, in addition to show all the other different parts of Jelly Bean. Well, I tell you what, here in Dayton, Ohio, you know we we are known as the city of funk, and oh, uh, you know, and, and here <laughs> hey, I, I've been in concert with a bunch of them bands. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center is here, and uh, you know we're we're trying to keep funk alive. And uh, can oh, you, I, and, I and thank tell God me, bless you because we need it. We need it, man. You know, and it's a lot of it. Trust me. It, it, it's a it's a whole lot of it, man. And we we're trying our best to make sure that we can keep this funk alive. Can you tell me a little bit of you know what do you think about this, the museum here and and things that we're trying to do here in Dayton, Ohio? Before uh, I let you go, you know, you know, Jerome Jerome had brought this to my attention, man, and it was just I, I'm just overjoyed, man, because you know we have our share of the historical things here at the Historical Society. We just have had a statue put up a Prince up in Henderson, Minnesota, and all that. So I just think it's great that there's a place like in, like the, the Funk Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, where, especially with y'all, because y'all have a bunch of iconic bands anyway that y'all could just have in your personal hall there. Yeah. In addition to all the other, you know, iconic punk bands from around the world and stuff. So I think that's a great thing you got going there, man, and that you go on and, and that people support it. That's the biggest thing is that our community supports it, you know and that you make it available for them. You know, this music is timeless, man. You know, still to this day, you know, people, especially the, uh, the black community is gonna come out and see us, you know, I have been coming out and supporting us all oh, these yeah. years. So it's great to have a, a museum where all of uh, our accomplishments are shown and, and people can go see and, and remember because a lot of this music changed people's lives. You know, it, it really did. It, 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 they remember, remember when they got married, remember when they met the first girl, you know, they went on their first date, all that stuff, man. Plus, I, I know because it affected me like that, you know, so. Well, Jelly Bean, I tell you what, man, you and the group and uh, all that you do for other groups, man, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's, it's just something to know uh, know you now, and, and, and I hope that our, our viewers know a little bit more now about Jelly Bean <laughs> Johnson, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate it. And, and and one thing about it, David Webb and his group here at the Funk Center, we, we, we want to thank you so much, man, because, you know, just artists like you is what makes the music just stay in our mind from generation to generation, man. And That's my job, man. That's you my know. job. I always tell people that. That's my job is make people happy, man. You know, even though the, the ups and downs of this, there's a lot of ups and downs in this business. That's... You know, the, anybody that's been in a black superstar band knows, you know, it's a lot of stuff. I won't get into the negativity today, but it's, 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 a, it's a teaching moment. It's a learning spirit. It, I, I deserve to go through it. I must have wanted, God must have wanted me to go through it because I did. And so we move on. We keep it moving and we stay funky. You know? Let's do it. Well, that's it, man. Let's stay funky. And again, thank you so much. Jelly yeah. Bean Johnson from the... <laughs> from time i tell you man thank you again <laughs> hey this is yep. stan the man host of the funk music hall of fame and exhibition center's award-winning show funk chronicles talk back until next time keep it funky Minneapolis, Minneapolis.
Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. 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 Br